Section thirty three of Agatha Webb. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. Agatha Webb by Anne Catherine Green. Part one of Why Agatha Webb will never be forgotten in sutherland town meanwhile sweetwater had been witness to a series of pantomimic actions that interested him more than amabel's conduct under this final examination frederick who had evidently some request to make or direction to give had sent a written line to the coroner who on reading it had passed it over to knapp who a few minutes later was to be seen in conference with agnes halliday as a result the latter rose and left the room followed by the detective she was gone a half an hour then simultaneously with her reappearance sweetwater saw knapp hand a bundle of letters to the coroner who upon opening them chose out several which he proceeded to read to the jury they were the letters referred to by frederick as having been given to him by his mother the first was dated thirty-five years previously and was in the handwriting of agatha herself it was directed to james Zabel and was read amid a profound hush dear james you are too presumptuous when i let you carry me away from john in that maddening reel last night i did not mean you to draw the inference you did that you did draw it argues a touch of vanity in a man who is not alone in the field where he imagines himself victor john who is humbler sees some merit in well in frederick snow let us say so do i but merit does not always win any more than presumption when we meet let it be as friends but as friends only a girl cannot be driven into love to ride on your big mare judith is bliss enough for my twenty years why don't you find it so too i think i hear you say you do but only when she stops at a certain gate on porchester highway folly there are other roads and other gates though if i should see you enter one there my pen is galloping away with me faster than judith ever did and it is time i drew rein present my regards to john but no then he would know i had written you a letter and that might hurt him how could he guess if it was only a scolding letter such as it would grieve him to receive and that it does not count for anything were it to frederick snow now there some horses are so hard to pull up and so are some pins i will come to a standstill but not before your door respectfully your neighbor agatha gilchrist dear james i know i have a temper a wicked temper and now you know it too when it is roused i forget love gratitude and everything else that should restrain me and other words i am myself astonished at but i do not get roused often and when all is over i am not averse to apologizing or even to begging forgiveness my father says my temper will undo me but i am much more afraid of my heart than i am of my temper for instance here i am writing to you again just because i raised my riding whip and said but you know what i said and i am not fond of recalling the words for i cannot do so without seeing your look of surprise and contrasting it with that of philemon's 
yours had judgment in it while philemon's held only indulgence yet i liked yours best or should have liked it best if it were not for the insufferable pride which is a part of my being temper such as mine ought to surprise you yet would i be agatha gilchrist without it i very much fear not and not being agatha gilchrist should i have your love again i fear not james forgive me when i am happier when i know my own heart i will have less provocation then if that heart turns your way you will find a great and bountiful serenity where now there are lowering and thunderous tempest philemon said last night that he would be content to have my fierce word of mornings if only i would give him one drop out of the honey of my better nature when the sun went down at twilight brought reflection and love but i did not like him any better for saying this you would not have the day so the cup with which you would refresh yourself must hold no bitterness will it not have to be proffered then by other hands than those of agatha gilchrist mr philemon webb respected sir you are persistent i am willing to tell you though i shall never confide so much to another that it will take a stronger nature than yours and one that loves me less to hold me faithful and make me the happy devoted wife which i must be if i would not be a demon i cannot i dare not marry where i am not held in a passionate self-forgetful subjection i am too proud too sensitive too little mistress of myself when angry or aroused if like some strong women i love what was weaker than myself i could be controlled by goodness and unlimited kindness i might venture to risk living at the sight of the most indulgent and upright man i know but i am not of that kind strength only can command my admiration or subdue my pride i must fear what i love and own for husband him who has first shown himself my master so do not fret any more for me for you less than any man i know will ever claim my obedience or command my love not that i will not yield my heart to you but that i cannot and knowing that i cannot feel it honest to say so before any more of your fine young manhood is wasted go your ways then philemon and leave me to the rougher paths my feet were made to tread i like you now and feel something like a tender regard for your goodness but if you persist in a courtship which only my father is inclined to smile upon you will call up an antagonism that can lead to nothing but evil for the serpent that lies coiled in my breast has deadly fangs and is to be feared as you should know who have more than once seen me angry do not blame john or james Sabel or frederick snow or even samuel barton for this it would be the same if none of these men existed i was not made to triumph over a kindly nature but to yield the haughtiest heart in all this county to the gentle but firm control of its natural master do you want to know who that master is i cannot tell you for i have not yet named him to myself dear james i am going away i am going to leave porchester for several months i am going to see the world i did not tell you this last night for fear or weakening under your entreaties or should i say commands lately i have felt myself weakening more than once and i want to know what it means absence will teach me absence and the sight of new faces 
Do you quarrel with this necessity? Do you think I should know my mind without any such test? Alas, James, it is not a simple mind, and it baffles me at times. Let us then give it a chance. If the glow and glamour of elegant city life can make me forget certain snatches of talk at our old gate, or that night when you drew my hand through your arm and softly kissed my fingertips, then I am no mate for you, whose love, however critical, has never wavered, but has made itself felt, even in rebuke, as the strongest, sweetest thing that has entered my turbulent life. Because I would be worthy of you, I submit to a separation which will either be a permanent one, or the last that will ever take place between you and me. John will not bear this as well as you, yet he does not love me as well, possibly because to him I am simply a superior being, while to you I am a loving but imperfect woman who wishes to do right, but can only do so under the highest guidance. Dear John, I feel that I owe you a letter because you have been so patient. You may show it to James if you like, but I mean it for you, as an old and dear friend, who will one day dance at my wedding. I am living in a whirl of enjoyment. I am seeing and tasting of pleasures I have only dreamed about till now. From a farmhouse kitchen to Mrs. Andrews' drawing room is a lively change for a girl who loves dress and show only less than daily intercourse with famous men and brilliant women. But I am bearing it nobly and have developed tastes I did not know I possessed. Expensive tastes, John, which I fear may unfit me for the humble life of a Porchester matron. Can you imagine me dressed in rich brocade, sitting in the midst of Washington's choices citizens and exchanging sallies with senators and judges you may find it hard yet so it is and no one seems to think i am out of place nor do i feel so only do not tell james there are movements in my heart at times which make me shut my eyes when the lights are brightest and dream if but for an instant of home and the tumble down gateway where i have so often leaned when someone you know who it is now john and i shall not hurt you too deeply by mentioning him was saying good night and calling down the blessings of heaven upon a head not worthy to receive them does this argue my speedy return perhaps yet i do not know there are fond hearts here also and a life in this country's centre could be a great life for me if only I could forget the touch of a certain restraining hand, which has great power over me even as a memory. For the sake of that touch, shall I give up the grandeur and charm of this broad life? Answer, John. You know him and me well enough now to say. Dear John, I do not understand your letter. You speak in affectionate terms of everybody, yet you beg me to wait and not to be in a hurry to return. Why? Do you not realize that such words only make me more anxious to see old Porchester again? If there is anything amiss at home, or if James is learning to do without me, but you do not say that, you only intimate that perhaps I will be better able to make up my mind later than now, and hint of great things to come if I will only hold my affections in check a little longer. This is all very ambiguous and demands a fuller explanation, so write to me once more, John, or I shall sever every engagement I have made here and return. Dear John, your letter is plain enough this time. James read the letter I wrote you about my pleasure in the life here and was displeased at it. 
he thinks i am growing worldly and losing that simplicity which he has always looked upon as my most attractive characteristic so so well james is right i am becoming less the country girl and more the woman of the world every day i remain here that means i am becoming less worthy of him so but whatever else i have to say on this topic must be said to him for this you will pardon me like the wood brother you are i cannot help my preference he is nearer my own age besides we were made for each other dear james i am not worldly i am not carried away by the pleasures and satisfactions of this place at least not to the point of forgetting what is dearer and better i have seen washington i have seen gay life i like it but i love porchester consequently i am going to return to porchester and that very soon indeed i cannot stay away much longer and if you are glad of this and if you wish to be convinced that a girl who has been wearing brocade and jewels can content herself quite gaily again with calico come up to the dear old gate a week from now and you will have the opportunity do you object to flowers i may wear a flower in my hair your wayward but ever constant agatha dear james why must i write why am i not content with the memory of last night when one's cup is quite full a cup that has been so long in filling must some few drops escape just to show that a great joy like mine is not satisfied to be simply quiescent i have suffered so long from uncertainty have tried you and tried myself with so tedious an indecision that now i know no other man can ever move my heart as you have done the ecstasy of it makes me over demonstrative i want to tell you that i love you that i do not simply accept your love but give you back in fullest measure all the devotion you have heaped upon me in spite of my many faults and failings you took me to your heart last night and seemed satisfied but it does not satisfy me that i just let you do it without telling you that i am proud and happy to be the chosen one of your heart and that as i saw your smile and the proud passion which lit up your face i felt how much sweeter was the dear domestic bliss you promised me than the more brilliant but colder life of a statesman's wife in washington i missed the flower from my hair when i went back to my room last night did you take it dear if so do not cherish it i hate to think of anything withering on your breast my love is deathless james and owns no such symbol as that but perhaps you are not thinking of my love but of my faults if so let the flower remain where you have put it and when you gaze on it say thus it is with the defects of my darling once in full bloom now a withered remembrance when i gather her they began to fade oh james i feel as if i never could feel anger again dear james i do not i cannot believe it though you said to me on going out your father will explain i cannot content myself with his explanations and will never believe what he said of you except you confirm his accusations by your own act if after i have told you exactly what passed between us you return me these and other letters then i shall know that i have leaned my weight on a hollow staff and that henceforth i am to be without protector or comforter in this world oh james were we not happy i believed in you and felt that you believed in me when we stood heart to heart under the elm tree was it only last night 
and you swore that if it lay in the power of earthly man to make me happy i should taste every sweet that a woman's heart naturally craved i thought my heaven had already come and that now it only remained for me to create yours yet that very minute my father was approaching us and in another instant we heard his words james i must talk with you before you make my daughter forget herself any further forget herself what happened this was not the way my father had been accustomed to talk much as he had always favoured the suit of philemon webb and pleased as he would have been had my choice fallen on him forget herself i looked at you to see how this insulting word would affect you but while you turned pale or seemed to do so in the fading moonlight you were not quite so unprepared for them as i was myself and instead of showing anger followed my father into the house leaving me shivering in a spot which had held no chill for me a moment before you were gone how long to me it seemed an hour and perhaps it was it would seem to take that long for a man's face to show such change as yours did when you confronted me again in the moonlight yet a lightning stroke makes quick work and perhaps my countenance in that one minute showed as great a change as yours else why did you shudder away from me and to my passionate appeal reply with this one short phrase your father will explain did you think any other words than yours would satisfy me or that i could believe even him when he accused you of a base and dishonest act much as i have always loved and revered my father i find it impossible not to hope that in his wish to see me united to philemon he has resorted to an unworthy subterfuge to separate us therefore i give you our interview word for word may it shock you as much as it shocked me here is what he said first agatha you cannot marry james zabel he is not an honest man he has defrauded me me your father of several thousand dollars in a clever way too showing him to be as subtle as he is unprincipled shall i tell you the wretched story my girl he has left me to do so he sees as plainly as i do that any communication between you two after the discovery i have this day made would be but an added offence he is at least a gentleman which is something considering how near he came to being my son-in-law i may have answered people do cry out when they are stabbed sometimes but i rather think i did not say a word only looked at his dane which at that minute was as measureless as my belief in you you dishonest you or perhaps i laughed that would have been truer to my feeling yes i must have laughed my father's next words indicated that i did something you do not believe in his guilt he went on and there was a kindness in his tone which gave me my first feeling of real terror i can readily comprehend that agatha he has been in my office and acted under my eye for several years now and i had almost as much confidence in him as you had notwithstanding the fact that i liked him much better as my confidential clerk than as your probably or prospective husband he has never held the key to my heart good god he never had to yours but he was a good and reliable man in the office or so i thought and i gave into his hand much of the work i ought to have done myself especially since my health has more or less failed me my trust he abused a month ago it was during that ill turn you remember 
i received a letter from a man i had never expected to hear from again he was in my debt some ten thousand dollars and wrote that he had brought with him as much of this sum as he had been able to save in the last five years to sutherlandtown where he was now laid up with a dangerous illness from which he had a small hope of recovering would i come there and get it he was a stranger and wished to take no one into his confidence but he had the money and would be glad to place it in my hands he added that as he was a lone man without friends or relatives to inherit from him he felt a decided pleasure at the prospect of satisfying his only creditor and devoutly hoped he would be well enough to realize the transaction and receive my receipt but if his fever increased and he should be delirious or unconscious when i reached him then i was to lift up the left-hand corner of the mattress on which he lay and take from underneath his head a black wallet in which i could find the money promised me he had elsewhere enough to pay all his expenses so that the full contents of the wallet were mine i remembered the man and i wanted the money so not being able to go for it myself i authorized james zabel to collect it for me he started at once for sutherlandtown and in a few hours returned with the wallet alluded to though i was suffering intensely at the time i remember distinctly the air with which he laid it down and the words with which he endeavoured to carry off a certain secret excitement visible in him mr orr was alive sir and fully conscious but we will not outlive the night he seemed quite satisfied with the messenger and gave up the wallet without any hesitation i roused up and looked at him what has shaken you up so i asked he was silent a moment before replying i have ridden fast said he then more slowly one feels sorry for a man dying alone and amongst strangers i thought he showed an unnecessary emotion but paid no further heed to it at the time the wallet held two thousand and more dollars which was less than i expected but yet a goodly sum and very welcome as i was counting it over i glanced at the paper accompanying it it was an acknowledgment of debt and mentioned the exact sum i should find in the wallet two thousand seven hundred and fifty three sixty seven pointing them out to james i remarked the figures are in different ink from the words how do you account for that i thought his answer rather long in coming though when it did come it was calm if not studied i presume he said that the sum was inserted at sutherlandtown after mr orr was quite sure just how much he could spare for the liquidation of this old debt very likely i assented not bestowing another thought upon the matter but to-day it has been forced back upon my attention in a curious if not providential way i was over in sutherlandtown for the first time since my illness and having some curiosity about my unfortunate but honest debtor i went to the hotel and asked to see the room in which he died it being empty they at once showed it to me and satisfied that he had been made comfortable in his last hours i was turning away when i spied on a table in one corner an inkstand and what seemed to be an old copy-book why i stopped and approached this table i do not know but once in front of it i remember what sable had said about the figures and taking up the pen i saw there i dipped it in the ink-pot and attempted to scribble a number or two on a piece of loose paper i found in the copy-book the ink was thick and the pen corroded 
so that it was not till after several ineffectual efforts that i succeeded in making any strokes that were at all legible but when i did they were so exact similar in color to the numbers inserted in mr orr's memorandum which i had fortunately brought with me that i was instantly satisfied this special portion of the writing had been done as james had said in this room and with the very pen i was then handling as there was nothing extraordinary in this i was turning away when a gust of wind from the open window lifted the loose sheet of paper i had been scribbling on and landed it the other side up on the carpet as i stooped for it i saw figures on it and feeling sure that they had been scrawled there by mr orr in his attempt to make the pen write i pulled out the memorandum again and compared the two minutely they were the work of the same hand but the figures on the stray leaf differed from those in the memorandum in a very important particular those in the memorandum began with a two while those on the stray sheet began with a seven a striking difference look agatha here is the piece of paper just as i found it you see here there and everywhere the one set of figures seven thousand seven hundred and fifty three sixty seven here it is hardly legible here it is blotted with too much ink here it is faint but sufficiently distinct and here well there can be no mistake about these figures seven thousand seven hundred and fifty three sixty seven yet the memorandum reads two thousand seven hundred fifty three sixty seven and the money returned to me amounts to two thousand seven hundred fifty three sixty seven a clean five thousand dollars difference here james my father paused perhaps to give me a commiserating look though i did not need it perhaps to give himself a moment in which to regain courage for what he still had to say i did not break the silence i was too sure of your integrity besides my tongue could not have moved if it would all my faculties seemed frozen except that instinct which cried out continually within me no there is no fault in james he has done no wrong no one but himself shall ever convince me that he has robbed any one of anything except poor me of my poor heart but inner cries of this kind are inaudible and after a moment's interval my father went on five thousand dollars is no petty sum and the discrepancy in the two sets of figures which seemed to involve me in so considerable a loss set me thinking convinced that mr orr would not be likely to scribble one number over so many times if it was not the one then in his mind i went to mr forsyth's office and borrowed a magnifying glass through which i again subjected the figures in the memorandum to a rigid scrutiny the result was a positive conviction that they had been tempered with after their first writing either by mr orr himself or by another whom i need not name the two had originally been a seven and i could even see where the top line of the seven had been given a curl and where a horizontal stroke had been added to the bottom agatha i came home as troubled a man as there was in all these parts i remember the suppressed excitement which had been in james Sable's face when he handed me over the money and i remembered also that you loved him or thought you did and that love or not love you were pledged to marry him if i had not recalled all this i might have proceeded more warily as it was 
i took the bold and open course and gave james zabel an opportunity to explain himself agatha he did not embrace it he listened to my accusations and followed my finger when i pointed out the discrepancy between the two sets of figures but he made no protestations of innocence nor did he show me the front of an honest man when i asked if he expected me to believe that the wallet had held only two thousand and over when mr orr handed it over to him on the contrary he seemed to shrink into himself like a person whose life has been suddenly blasted and replying that he would expect me to believe nothing except his extreme contrition at the abuse of confidence of which he had been guilty begged me to wait till to-morrow before taking any active steps in the matter i replied that i would show him that much consideration if he would immediately drop all pretensions to your hand this put him on a bad way but he left as you see with such a simple injunction to you to seek from me an explanation of his strange departure does that look like innocence or does it look like guilt i found my tongue at this and passionately cried james Zabel's life as i have known it shows him to be an honest man if he has done what you suggest given you but a portion of the money entrusted to him and altered the figures in the memorandum to suit the amount he brought you then there is a discrepancy between this act and all the other acts of his life which i find it more difficult to reconcile than you did the two sets of figures in mr orr's handwriting father i must hear from his own lips a confirmation of your suspicions before i will credit them and this is why i write to you some minute an account of what passed between my father and myself last night if his account of the matter is a correct one and you have nothing to add to it in way of explanation then the return of this letter will be token enough that my father has been just in his accusations and that the bond between us must be broken but if oh james if you are the true man i consider you and all that i have heard is a fabrication or mistake then come to me at once do not delay but come at once and the sight of your face at the gate will be enough to establish your innocence in my eyes agatha End of part one of why Agatha Webb will never be forgotten in Sutherland Town. Recorded by Gabby Cowan.